So uh, let's uh, let's get started with this afternoon's lesson. So um, I put a picture up here that was uh, a famous picture. It's called Lunch on a Skyscraper, and it's from 1932. And these people here are construction workers, and they're building uh, a skyscraper in New York. Uh, I think it's, uh, it was called the Rockefeller Building or the Rockefeller Skyscraper or something. Uh, and so they're having their lunch break and I think this has probably been posed. The photographers told them all to sit here. But you can see that uh, um, these guys don't have any fear of heights. I would be um, bricking it, I think, if, uh, if I was sitting here looking down on New York like this. But uh, these guys, that's just their, part of their job. Now... The reason I put this photo up here is because we're talking about um, metals um, and their modern uses today. So we're focusing on two, two types of metals today. So what skyscrapers were made of um, are two main materials. A lot of skyscrapers were, especially early ones, were, had a lot of concrete, so just a man-made type of rock, artificial rock. And the other material that most skyscrapers have inside them is steel. And these guys are sitting right on a, a massive piece of steel. It's called a steel girder. Now, why is steel used for skyscrapers? It's because steel is incredibly strong. So um, when you're building something so tall, it needs to take a lot of pressure, not snap, not break. And so steel is the right sort of material for that sort of business. So what is steel? Where does it come from? So let's have a, have a quick look. So this guy here is, a, again, looking at the construction. So steel is metal. It's made of, you can make it into these strong beams like this, and girders, and this guy's bolting it together. But really, steel is iron. A lot of people don't know that. So steel is basically mostly made of iron. So remember back to the Iron Age that we were talking about last lesson? Um, the Iron Age, where people were making swords and shields and armour and tools out of iron. Well, steel is basically the modern version of iron. It is iron with just a little bit of um, a carbon added. So a few atoms here and there of carbon. And look what the difference, difference it makes. So iron is just here. This is pure 100% iron. All the iron atoms are nice and neatly laid out. And Iron with a little bit of carbon added makes steel, and that's called an alloy. Now, if you remember back to lesson two, we talked about how you can make alloys out of copper, um, and when you add add a few things to copper, you can make an alloy called bronze. Well, this is the same thing, but it's iron. Why is it called steel? Is it well? Basically, people don't use that much pure iron anymore in today's you know modern times. People have found that. Iron is not quite as useful because it's quite soft, it's not so strong, whereas if you add just a few carbon atoms to the mixture, then you get something that's way better, steel, better than iron. It's harder, stronger, lasts longer, and you can basically, just by adding a little bit to the mixture, you can make an iron alloy. So it's not true to say it's not, not iron, uh, it is mostly iron, it's 98% iron, but it's just a little bit of steel added. So, that's what steel is. You can see, does anyone remember, we talked a bit, when we were talking about alloys in lesson two, we talked a bit about what makes them harder and more difficult to bend. So look at the way these little iron atoms are lined up with each other. Why do you think this one here might be more difficult to bend than this 100% pure iron here? Anyone sort of give me any answers in chat? Hello, Stephen. Sophie, this isn't going to be the last lesson. It's the last lesson of the metals topic. Um, and then we're going to start a new topic next week. So I will be doing some, uh, some lessons over these holidays as well. So, so, Charlie, this one here, the iron atoms on their own, pure iron, is more bendy and less strong than iron atoms with some extra carbon added. So why exactly is this stronger and more difficult to bend? It's to do with these little atoms that have got into the mixture here. What's going on here? Imagine trying to bend this iron here. What can these atoms do easily that these atoms can't do very well? 
it is to do with them being different sizes, Charlie. The carbon atoms just a little bit smaller than the iron atoms. It's not just that there's more atoms, Sienna, because I think there's probably just as many atoms here as there are here, but there's something to do with this one which makes it difficult. Charlie, that's excellent. Well done. It's because they can't slide very easily. So when you add atoms of a different size, they can't slide backwards and forwards very easily. Well done. Both Charlie's got that answer. That's excellent. Charlie, I'll have to mark you down for a, a prize pencil. Here we go. Got my, uh, got my pencils here. In fact, I've got a whole, whole box of pencils still to give away. I have 83 pencils still left to, to give away here, so we do need to do some more lessons. Charlie Stanard. Right. Right. So, they can't slide past each other easily. And that is a lot of the things about alloys. By adding a few extra things into the mix, you just make them much tougher, much harder, because they can't slide over each other very well. All right? So, I put this up here as a keyword. An alloy is just any time you have a mixture of a metal with any other elements. Nice to eat chocolate in a science lesson, Lily. You can eat as much as you like, you can have a drink, you can go to the loo if you like and catch up later. <laughs> it's very relaxing doing science lessons. I can have a cup of tea, well I usually have a cup of tea anyway in, in, in class, but uh, it is very relaxing. Hopefully you can ask questions as well, people are asking questions in the chat, which is really good. So, steel is an alloy made of iron. You can see here, I put three recipes for making steel on this little table here and just like uh, bronze was a mixture of mostly copper with other um, atoms added well here's some recipes that are mostly can anyone remember what is the symbol for iron the metal iron uh, and it's not it doesn't begin with an I or anything like that so what was the chemical symbol on the periodic table for the metal iron Lauren's got her dog with her while you're doing science. Hope your dog's paying attention. Lauren? Or is he asleep? I think my lessons generally send people to sleep. Ah, Sophie, it's not CU. Sienna's got it. Well done, Sienna. I'll just mark that down. It's FE for iron. Let me just uh, bring up, where's our little periodic table? Uh, the periodic table is here and iron is right here. There we go. F-E, iron. Um, something to do with the Latin name, ferrous or ferrum. So, and then here's the copper uh, that we were talking about earlier. So, if you want some recipes for making the steel, then these recipes are all pretty good. We've got regular steel, which is called carbon steel. 98% iron, 2% carbon, and 0% other metals. So you can see it's just got two things, iron and carbon. And this is very strong, long lasting. If, <laughs> uh, Lauren's dog is learning a lot. That's, that's good to hear, Lauren. <laughs> How do you know that she's learning a lot? Have you, get her to do the quiz at the end of the lesson. Maybe you'll, uh, maybe you'll see how she's doing. What's next? There's something called stainless steel, which you might have heard of. Um, it is steel that is very good. It, it's resistant to rusting. So you can make, for example, cutlery out of stainless steel and it will never, or like it would probably take hundreds of years to rust away. And stainless steel is the regular recipe with some iron and some carbon, but with a little bit of this metal here. Should we find it? Uh, CR, let's have a look for CR. I don't know if anyone knows what the metal CR is actually. Probably not, if you don't know your periodic table off by heart, but should we look for CR? CR, okay, it's one of these blue ones. Here it is. It's a bit of chromium. So stainless steel has got a bit of chromium added. Now, uh, Matt's question, Matt's question, if this is the recipe, 88% iron, 1% carbon, what percent is chromium? How much of that is chromium? Uh, 
if it's 88% iron, 1% carbon. Charlie Stannard's got the right answer. <laughs> Good, Charlie. <laughs> well done. So if you do the adding up here, or oh, quickly followed, followed by Sophie and Sienna. Right on the ball there. So if you have 88% iron plus 1% carbon, that makes 89%, and then the rest of the 100% must be 11%. So <laughs> lots of people coming in with the answers. First up was Charlie. First to type was Charlie. Good. So that's the way these recipes work. They always add up to 100, obviously. But chromium, I'll just click here. Click here, chromium, 11%. That makes you some stainless steel. Uh, if you want steel that is really good in hot conditions, so if it's in a machine which is getting extremely hot, for example, then uh, you have to add a little bit of tungsten. Okay, so who can get this then? So how much, what percentage tungsten? That's uh, W, the metal W. Sienna's got it. She, Sienna was right on, uh, right on, <laughs> right on the ball there before I even asked the question. It's 2% tungsten, that's right. So uh, 96 plus 2 gives you 98 plus there must be 2% tungsten. So you can see here there's various different, there are hundreds of different steel recipes. I'm not a steel expert, but all of these recipes will give you, their, what they've got in common is they're mostly made of iron, Fe, but they've also got some, uh, they've all got, always got a little bit of carbon in there, and then they've got a few other things added to the mixture to give them some different, what we call properties of like useful things about the steel. All right, I found a little video here which is going into a steelworks. And the steelworks, I just thought I'd show you on the map here. There's a bit of a sad story to this video. This video was made in 2015. And I'll tell you about the sad story in a second. Let me just first let me show you where the steelworks is. So here's Rayleigh. We do not have many places that make steel around here in, in Rayleigh. But we do have uh, in England in a... in a city of Middlesbrough. Now Middlesbrough is in the north of England, up here, northeast of England. They have a great football team. In fact, you can see the Middlesbrough football stadium. It's called the Riverside. It's right here on the map. Now Middlesbrough is on a river called the River Tees. And if you go to the where the river meets the sea, over here you can see this enormous place here is the steelworks of Middlesbrough. Now, I've been making steel in Middlesbrough for decades, and lots of people in Middlesbrough work at the steel factory. So, uh, you can see here, it's a massive great place with all of this stuff here. That's all the um, things that come in by ship and get delivered to the iron ore. All right, okay, so here's the, here's the I'll show you the video first, and then I'll tell you the, the slightly, a bit of a sad story afterwards, but, um, so here's the, here's the clip of them making steel in Middlesbrough. Steel is one of the strongest and most resilient alloys there is. And it's used to make a lot of everyday objects that we take for granted, like cutlery and cars. But it's also used for things on a much grander scale, like stadiums and skyscrapers. I'm at SSI Steel in Teesside. They take raw iron ore that's been mined overseas and by using a blast furnace, extract the impurities in the ore using carbon in a process known as a reduction reaction. That fresh liquid iron comes out of the blast furnace and is loaded into these torpedo ladles, which are then taken to the steel part of the factory on their very own rail track. The liquid iron still contains about 4% carbon, so it's very brittle. The carbon level will need to be further reduced to turn the iron into stronger steel. We transfer roughly about 220 tonnes from that torpedo into what we call a transfer ladle. Which is basically just a big bucket uh, with a refractory brick lining inside. It's almost like a, a thermos flask to keep all that heat and energy within the actual iron itself. Then what happens? We're actually adding a lot of merchant recycled scrap, and it can be anything from fridges to old buildings to demolition materials. We actually add it as a coolant. The scrap metal, along with the liquid iron, goes into a converter, a vessel that holds all the materials ready to be turned into steel. Without adding recycled scrap metal, the heat could reach 1,700 degrees Celsius, which could actually melt the converter. 
and it's called basic oxygen steel making, isn't it? Where does the oxygen come in? We actually send an oxygen lance into the vessel to hover to roughly about four metres above the steel bath itself, and then it blows oxygen at a rate of 750 metres cubed a minute. And it's almost like a rocket ship. The oxygen hits the carbon in the steel, it produces CO and CO2. Ah, it's getting rid of the carbon Absolutely. again. Absolutely. Customers require steel with different levels of carbon to create strength and flexibility depending on the process. The BOS process can now be completed and the fresh liquid steel goes into its final stage. You just never would imagine that steel looked like this. It's, it's hot, isn't it? Yeah, it's very hot. It's still about 1,400 degrees at this stage, so it's just Whoa. enough to be solidified, but it's obviously still glowing red hot. Water boils at just 100 degrees Celsius, so you can imagine how hot 1,400 degrees would be. We slowly drain the steel from the actual bucket itself, yeah. and we pour the steel into what we call a copper mould. That copper mould is literally chocolate bar shaped like a slab, yeah. but it's still molten in the middle, a bit like a caramel in a chocolate bar. It solidifies, and then you get this final slab. Over the next 12 hours, the red heat colour will start to fade from the slabs, but they will still be warm for a further 48 hours. The slab piece is about 15 to 20 tonnes, depending on what the customer requires. Oh, just 15 to 20 tonnes? Yeah. No, not Quite that a small one. Yeah, yeah, not much. <laughs> so, the steel with higher carbon content will make products like blades for cutting tools that need to be hard and rigid. And the steel with lower carbon, which is strong but can still bend, will be better for things like car bodywork. So the next time you're crossing a bridge in a car or you're at a stadium watching a football team play, remember where those pieces of steel came from that are holding it all together. Rocks, just like this, from the ground. All right, guys, so that was how to make steel, a little clip of how to make steel. So <laughs> it has nothing to do with chocolate, but uh, it did look like a little bit of a chocolate bar when it came out here. So the main thing they did was they used something called a blast furnace. So regular iron, once you get regular iron, has quite a lot of carbon in it, it has about 5% carbon. And that is too much um, for steel because... Um, it makes it uh, what's called brittle, which means it sort of uh, snaps or cracks too easily. So what they do is they blast oxygen. And you saw when they blew oxygen into this uh, furnace here, they get enormous sort of like um, amount of flame coming out here. And what that does is it takes away some of the carbon because the carbon reacts with oxygen to make carbon dioxide. And it takes it from 5% down to about 2 or 1% carbon. So. That's how a blast furnace, an oxygen blast furnace, um, reduces the amount of carbon. So that's, uh, that's how to make recipes of steel. Um, now the sad story, so this reminded me about the sad story. So the sad story is that Middlesbrough as a town, um, hundreds of people worked in the steel making process and for the factories and um, sort of like uh, places that were close to the steel making process. So lots and lots of families earned their living um, by working as a steel making place. And unfortunately, um, steel making in England is going through a bit of a tough time because there are places in different parts of the world that are making steel uh, in competition and they're a little bit cheaper than um, the places where they can make them in England. And so the, the whole factory, the whole town of Middlesbrough um, is um, going through a bit of a tough time because this factory closed soon after that video was being made. So the people you saw explaining how the steel was made in that video, a lot of them will have lost their jobs and a lot of them will be looking elsewhere to try and um, perhaps get a job in, in another place. But it's really difficult because there's only sort of uh, three, four, five places where steel is actually manufactured here in the UK. So. It's really tough for a town like Middlesbrough when a lot of people get employed in um, in a huge factory like this. It's really tough when uh, when that has to close. So let's come back to our lesson for today. So let's uh, just get this back up here. So second half of today's lesson is looking at a different metal. So steel is made of iron, mostly iron, but with it's an alloy of iron. And our other metal, 
I want you to try and guess what is the second metal we're talking about today. So uh, I've put a picture up here, which should make things much easier. Uh, what is the other metal that we're talking about today? It is lightweight. It is lighter than iron, but not as strong. And alloys of this metal are used for making drinks cans, cars, bikes, and aeroplanes. Uh, Sophie, it is not tin, actually. So tin is, and it's not copper, so Erin. Uh, so... Uh, we've had guesses of tin and we've had guesses of copper. So a lot of people call these tin cans, but they're not actually tin cans. Uh, maybe they used to be made of tin, but these days they're not made of tin any longer. Uh, it's not silver, Sienna. Plastic, Lewis. Well, if this was plastic, we wouldn't be calling it a metal because plastic doesn't come into that category. Ah, uh, Lewis Wheelies and Mates 11. Good afternoon. He has got the right answer. So... Let's just write down. Well done, Lewis. That was your first contribution for this afternoon. And you got the right answer. Got in there for the prize. Isabel Jones was a second after him. I think Lewis was first with the answer of aluminium. So this metal that we're talking about in the second half of today is called aluminium. So aluminium, unlike iron, is really lightweight. If you hold a piece of aluminium, um, it... Uh, you can feel a massive difference. This is uh, an advert for the new Audi. <laughs> I'm never going to be able to afford an Audi A8, but I can see that maybe I'd be able to afford half of an Audi A8, which is uh, the aluminium frame here. And modern cars are uh, more and more being made of um, with an aluminium frame. The reason for that is, if it's a lighter car, then you use a lot less fuel to drive along with. So it's really good for making your car much lighter. It's also probably easier to drive, so it turns around corners a bit easier. Um, what else can you make with aluminium? Well, you can make bikes with aluminium. Bikes have been made out of aluminium for a long time. Perhaps when I was your age in the 1990s, a lot of bikes were made of steel and they were very heavy, but aluminium bikes have kind of taken over since then. And you can, you know, you'd rather be riding around on an aluminium bike because uh, it's just probably about half the weight of the steel bike here. Dementis, I am reading your messages here. <laughs> Use aluminium for planes and cars. That's not right, Lauren. Planes, cars, and bikes. So, um, and then what else have we got? Uh, oh, but these days, by the way, guys, there's something even lighter than aluminium called carbon fibre, which is a lot of a lot of bikes made of carbon fibre. That's not a metal, though. And then planes have been made. Did you know the first planes were not made of metal? Does anyone know what... Uh, when planes were first invented, the first aeroplanes, they weren't made of metal at all. Do you know what they were made of to keep them lightweight? Anyone want to suggest? Lewis, wheelies and mates, 11. He's got the right answer again. Well done. The first planes are made of um, lightweight wooden materials. So imagine that, flying around in a, in a wooden plane. Seems really uh, really crazy. But something like the Spitfire and the Hurricane in World War II and biplanes earlier than that were made of wood. No, Sienna, Sophie, the, the, the plastic were, plastics weren't even invented uh, back at the time of sort of World War Two or in the 1930s and 40s, so um, they wouldn't have. They were just starting to make the first plastics during World War Two. So, would the wood catch fire, Erin? Um, not necessarily. I mean, uh, I don't think the engines themselves were made of wood, but the most of the airframe, the the sort of like the wings and the body and the fuselage of the plane was made of wood. So, because um, it was very lightweight, but then. Straight after wood, I don't think you've ever flown around in a wooden aeroplane. Most of the aeroplanes that you fly around with these days are made of aluminium. So it's great because it's just really, really lightweight and quite strong, but not as strong as uh, steel is. Okay, so uh, what did I want to... So I need to just... Last thing for today. So I need to just take you back to... Uh, so second last thing for today. Take you back to, to last lesson. Last lesson we talked about... 
how you can, um, how different metals had something called a reactivity, how reactive they were. And that basically means how good at getting hold of oxygen they are. So gold uh, was a metal that we usually find on its own as a nugget of gold, and that's because it's not very reactive. It doesn't like to join up with oxygen. So I've tried to draw this as a picture with gold. The symbol for gold is AU. It's on its own. And that means that when we get some gold out of the river, remember the Egyptians getting their gold, it's easy to get the gold because it doesn't join up with anything else. It just comes as a pure gold nugget. Now, at, in the very first lesson of this series, back in lesson one, we talked about copper and how people got the green rocks out of the, out of the ground and then invented a way to get the copper uh, on its own out of the green rock by what's called smelting. So that means that they got copper and they heated it with charcoal to remove the oxygen and got copper on its own. And copper is quite easy to do that with because it doesn't hang on to oxygen very tightly. So it doesn't, basically gold doesn't hang on to oxygen at all. It's very unreactive. Copper doesn't hold on to oxygen very well, so it lets go of the oxygen quite easily. So you can just heat it up a little bit and add some charcoal and you get pure copper. Then about 2000 years later, people worked out how to extract iron from iron ore. And that's because iron holds on to oxygen really quite tightly. So iron and oxygen are difficult to separate. You can't get rid of the oxygen very well. And it took them quite a long time, ancient peoples quite a long time, to figure out how to um, extract pure iron from this. So basically you're getting harder and harder to separate the metal from the oxygen as you go up this little screen here. All right. And then the hardest metal on this screen to get away from oxygen is aluminium. And that's the reason why, well, Demantis, that's a good question. Copper doesn't hate oxygen. It just, these metals up here like oxygen even more. And they like to hang on to their oxygen. They hold on very tightly to oxygen. So gold is the one that hates oxygen. Gold doesn't do anything with oxygen. Copper will get hold of some oxygen to make copper oxide. That's the green rock but it doesn't hold on to the oxygen very well. And these metals here hold on to their oxygen much more tightly. So um, iron is more difficult to extract. You have to get a really high temperature, really hot charcoal and so on to remove the oxygen. And then aluminium, there's a reason that ancient people never discovered aluminium, even though I bet they've seen these orange rocks before. They never discovered aluminium because it is very hard to get away from the oxygen. It's called extracting it from its ore. This is an ore here, the rock. And aluminium just hangs on to oxygen very, very strongly. So we say gold is very unreactive. We say copper is quite unreactive and you get more reactive as you go up here. And aluminium is very reactive as a metal and it hangs on to oxygen. And really we've only, I don't know when the, when the first aluminium was extracted, but aluminium as a material was probably only been invented for less than 200 years. So, so it's been much more of a modern metal. I mean, it's pretty cool aluminium. That's, that's why we build planes, bikes, and uh, cars out of aluminium. But you know, ancient people had no idea there was such a thing as aluminium because they had never extracted it from its ore. You need electricity, you need very high energy, you need, it's very expensive to get, get pure aluminium, okay? So, which one was the first one to be used by humans? Gold, because it exists on its own. You can just pick it out of a river. Which one was the second one to be used by humans? Copper, because it's quite easy to separate from the green rock. Which one was the third one to be used by humans? iron uh, because it's quite hard to separate from the oxygen and which one was the last one to be used by humans it was this one here the aluminium because it's very difficult to separate from oxygen all right and let's have the last thing that i was going to show you today was just a very quick mention about recycling so let me ask you a question here a lot of the time, I think most of the aluminium we use, because it is super expensive to get from the aluminium rock, um, a lot of the time we 
uh, recycle our aluminium. So if you have some cans, you take your cans, perhaps you put it into the recycling at home, um, you have to take it to a recycling bank at the local supermarket, but recycling aluminium has a couple of big advantages. It saves you some money, because it's really expensive to get brand new aluminium, and it also saves on electricity. So why do people always say saving electricity is really good? Why do people say, who can answer this for me in chat? Why, what's, the, what's the good side about saving electricity? Why, why do we worry about electricity and how much electricity we're using? Here's a little um, hint for you here. This is a generating plant making electricity. and it is to do with the environment. So if we want to, why is, when we make electricity, why are people using too much electricity? It saves you on your bills, Demantis. So that's the thing. If you're paying for your electricity in your house, then that's a big thing there. Uh, Dylan says it keeps the air and the planet clean and healthy. Lewis says we are running out of coal and fossil fuels. That's a good thing. Sophie says it will cause less air pollution. And Sienna says it will save the environment. That's really good. So there's you've got the answers there, guys. The um, When Dylan said about air pollution, when we make electricity by burning uh, things called fossil fuels, so the fossil fuels are coal, oil, and natural gas, when we burn those fuels to make our electricity, uh, the gas that goes up into the atmosphere is carbon dioxide, and that is warming up our planet which is a whole other story. Overwarming. I think you mean global warming there, Freddie. But yeah, that's right. So basically, if we can use less electricity, then we don't have to burn so much of these things in the generators, which means that there's less carbon dioxide going up to our planet. Now, in the long term, what we need to do is basically just stop using these power generators, uh, these type of power generators altogether. We can switch to other ways of making electricity. If we use wind turbines or solar, then uh, it doesn't matter how much electricity you use because it doesn't make pollution if you use wind turbines or solar. So that's probably what we need to do in the long term. But in the short term, if you recycle your cans, you use less electricity, and that means that there's less air pollution, carbon dioxide going up into the atmosphere. 